Hello, everyone. Welcome to the EA Global Summit 2020. This is Nizam. I'm part of the organizing team. And with us, we have Matt and Paul. Matt is a system design architect and Paul is the president of Institution of Analysts and Programmers. And we have the speakers presenting about model co-production with Prolaborate. Like all the other sessions that we have seen earlier today, we look forward for this exciting session as well. And there's been a remarkable uh, interest in this session with a very high registration uh, rate. So we look forward to this session, Matt and Paul. And just a quick note before I pass it back to Matt for the presentation, all the uh, people who are attending this session, please join our channel in MS Teams, the link for which will be shared in your chat window. And it's, so, it's been shared to you already as well. Uh, please raise your questions or anything that you would like to ask the presenters in the Teams channel. And towards the end of the presentation, if you have some time, we'll raise some of those questions as part of this presentation. But once the presentation is done, we request the presenters to be available in the EA Teams to discuss with you and provide you a more elaborate uh, response. So with that said, I welcome Matt and Paul once again, and over to you, Matt. Whatever day it is, um, where you are, um, I, I just can't start this presentation without a huge, huge thanks to Nizam and his team for arranging this fantastic event. Um, it will have been and likely remains a great deal of work for them. But um, as I can see, it's turning out to be a marvelous success. I've really enjoyed some of the sessions I've attended. My thanks also extend to Sparks and indeed the Toolchain community um, for bringing a world-class platform to us. And it's actually such a privilege for us both to be on your stage talking to your community. And we therefore want to um, our presentation to offer something back to you all. Before we move on to that, perhaps we need to say a little about ourselves. Um, when it comes to highly esteemed colleagues, please let us welcome my co-presenter, Paul, who is recognized for his good work in our field since he is fellow and president of the Institution of Analysts and Programmers. Thanks, Matt. I'm interested in producing high quality systems that are fit for purpose and trustworthy. I've been a freelance software developer, architect and consultant over the last 13 years. Uh, I hold several enterprise and solution architect certifications, including TOGAF 9.1 to level two. And I'm now working for a large health sector enterprise designing solutions for patient care management, where I met Matt. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, when I first encountered Sparks EA in about 2004, I was fresh from doing my engineering doctorate, which I'd also achieved chartered engineer status. I was deep into using a different UML tool with a five-figure price tag. And, well, I was in love. So when a colleague presented EA, I was skeptical. Three years later, I was a freelance consultant using Sparks to design a new system for communicable disease surveillance in Wales. And it's actually still playing its part today. Three years, years later, um, working in a finance industry on digital transformation, um, I also became TOGAF certified, and that experience taught me much about the hurdles to transform successfully. Much of that learning informs what we have to talk about today, model co-production with Prolaborate. Actually, it's not only Prolaborate, but also, indeed, the Sparks ecosystem comprises several collaboration tools designed for modelers and non-modelers alike. Your model is out there. Don't neglect the onboard collaboration tools within AA itself. Indeed, many of you will already have learned about the refinements to these in the 5.2 release. With a cloud serve model, you can work together on the same model at different times and locations and stay on the same page, or should I say, stay on the same diagram. With the non-modelers, there are document-driven approaches where traditional documentation formats are generated from the model. In the last decade, these documents became interactive with the EA Docs Collaboration Edition, putting those documents onto the web where, literally, you make documents into conversations. Oh, Ian doesn't mind me stealing his tagline there, but it, it is about his product. Document-driven approaches play a vital role in the armory of reaching the non-modeling community. The latest wave of developments, however, is where things really take off. With the likes of Prolaborate, 
and ProCloud Server and WebEA, we can now have discussions over live views of the model anywhere and at any time. You'll learn a lot more about these from others in, in the community um, in, in the summit. So it's in this ecosystem, we should suggest, that there's paved the way for the realization of model co-production. Paul. Thanks, Matt. In the most basic sense, the co-production concept simply extends collaboration within the enterprise to producing models with its supply chain members and user base. This enables clients and suppliers to co-produce requirements and design to close the understanding gap and thereby smooth commercial contract work. However, there are concerns over allowing the external stakeholders to access the enterprise's IP and putting it in the cloud. Taking this approach, we do not share the entire enterprise architecture blueprint, only the building blocks and essential items for the discussion that is needed. Even those are only accessible to those that we grant access to in a secure cloud environment. As Gandalf said to gain access to the mines of Moria, speak friend and enter. To anyone else, you shall not pass. Thank you, Paul. And it is this you shall not pass aspect that needs some examination, further examination today, I feel. So represented on the left is a typical pre-COVID enterprise, silo teams within an organizational boundary, with many forces acting upon its knowledge workers to focus within the organization. That is often and in ways as it should be, but an issue arises, particularly when it comes to working with external organizations in the supply chain who also act in that way. Knowledge workers must then work against the normal tendency. Post COVID, knowledge workers have been cast to the four corners and enabled with new technologies that go a long way to dissolving the hard organizational boundary. It even looks a little bit like COVID, doesn't it? Science historian James Burke last week used the term cultural enruption to describe COVID 19 as bringing forward technological and cultural change that might have otherwise taken the next 20 years to complete. So what does this mean for organizations, their knowledge workers, and how they interact with other organizations? Culturally, the scene is set for more fluid and open relationships between knowledge workers across organizations. Organizations that get this and facilitate it grab a competitive advantage, or at least, they survive. To gain competitive advantages in this brave new world, organizational attitude to using cloud services needs to be more embracing, an opportunity, but also a latent security concern. We want to show how risk aversion can be met with progressive approaches. As Matt has outlined, the motivation for model co-production is straightforward and is particularly pertinent for the current global circumstances. All stakeholders need to reach a common understanding, attained through multiple perspectives, yet all working remotely together for a collective purpose. Before getting to the heart of model co-production, we first going to cover some prerequisites. We're assuming you're already familiar with EA and modeling familiar with at least one variety of development methodology, anywhere from waterfall to a variety of agile, and you know at least something about Prolaborate. If you don't, then this is a good time as any to engage in a bit of osmosis. Our goals for this session will be, at the end of this session, you should have a good idea of what model co-production is, how you can do it, and the benefits that will be gained by practicing model co-production. To achieve our goals, we will be carrying out a demonstration, and this will show how to operate co-production, taking you through its steps, then rounding off with an appraisal of the process we've taken. Lastly, we will reflect what has taken place, summarising what has been learnt, before we open up the session for discussion. So please save your questions for the end. What is model co-production? 
Well, as a client organization of complex products and services requiring agreement about the requirements and design, we want a way of working together to reach collective outcomes. And as a supplier organization, we want the same as the client. Built on the principles that those who are affected by a service are best placed to help design it. Co-production enables the stakeholders to come to a common understanding and produce a design that works for all parties. This could be compared to mob programming but the mob comes together at a distance and at different times and to build a model rather than code. We like model co-production as it empowers people to have a stake in the outcome and to work together with a common goal. Because we like it, we have decided to apply the term model co-production to this endeavor. You heard it here first. Perhaps, uh, but it's fair to say, actually that with Palabrate recently exceeding the 100 customer mark, hey, brilliant, many will be already be co-producing regardless of having heard the term. I just think it's good to give a label to it. By reducing gaps in understanding, co-production affords people with different perspectives to get an overall feeling for the problem domain. We can all see parts of the elephant and that it is an elephant. Building together reduces the likelihood of friction between supply chain partners leading to mutual assets for the commercial relationship going forwards. The higher the level of engagement across all stakeholders, the more eyes on the problem, the shallower the flaws or emissions will be, i.e. they surface before they become a problem and so you increase quality. Building quality earlier, and you also get to the end result sooner. Often people who work as a team give a greater commitment than when they're working on their own. They don't wanna let the team down. With this cooperation, a more rounded solution can be arrived at in a shorter space of time. We hope you now have an insight into what co-production is and its benefit. And Matt will now outline the approach. Thank you, Paul. So the stage is set. Um, here we have the collaboration theme under which the co-production epic sits. And under that, there are three user stories. The first uh, is the obvious one, really, and that's iterating a model with the supply chain partners. And that's probably why you signed up for this piece. You'll want to know how that persona, Caroline co-producer, and the other persona alongside Maud Modeler how they can play nicely together. The insight we want to give is how you make Caroline and Maud's creative output get off on the best foot and then be suitable for harnessing within a highly governed archit architecture repository. That's where Graham Governor and his two user stories come, come in. For uploading the draft candidate architecture to a co-production workspace, and later, after Caroline and Maud have done their battles, to bring the approved target architecture back into the architecture repository. Graham Governor enacts some heavyweight user stories then. We'll out the, outline those in some detail. But this is what they are in brief. It's about taking an architecture state carbon copy to the co-production workspace for onward development and then returning it in a way that allows the gaps to be seen. Gap analysis is a feature that is supported within Spark CA. What we'd like to show is a real-time view of your gaps so that as your model changes, your view of the gap changes without manual intervention. And we're going to show how this is all about change with the architecture state modeling profile and software by Architrace Limited that enables that live gap analysis between states. So what kind of setup do we need to enable this, the co-production and the gap analysis? Well, something like this. Although this is not prescriptive, first we have an architecture repository that acts as a single source of truth in the client site. Being the architecture blueprint, it contains your corporate IP and the keys to your safe. 
hey, cyber crims, this is how you get in. Not surprisingly, corporates in the defense, health, finance, government, and other sectors have had some reluctance about putting all this in the cloud. In fact, they still have that reluctance. The architecture repository should also be formally governed and therefore more concrete. Not lending itself easily to being exposed to all the creative energy of Caroline, co-producer and her kin. Things could get messy when you're co-producing. So how do we keep things both fluid and tight? We're looking for a way to enable the more creative and fluid workings of our co-producers, yet build something that will be coherent when we when brought back to the main architecture repository. So to bridge the two, we are using architecture building blocks stored in a library within a reusable asset service. This acts as the golden source of templates from which you can build models on either side of the divide. But they're not your architecture. Sharing them does not unlock the jewels, the crown jewels. They're just a pile of Lego bricks. Well, admittedly, they're lovely and invaluable Lego bricks, but they don't tell you about your architecture estate. They tell you about the possibilities of your architecture estate without giving the game away. So putting these in the cloud is not leaving the keys in the safe. We'll expand on all this as we progress through the demo. In this example, Corona Farm Corp operates a TOGAF based repository and also have an on-premise instance of Prolaborate in order to collaborate within the enterprise. Corona Farm are working with consulting firm Architrace who provide tenancy on a co-production workspace. This comprises three databases. First, a reusable asset service, as we touched upon just now. Second, a model in which to do the refinement of a candidate's architecture by Maud Modeler. And third, the Prolaborate database, but database with its web application that enables model-driven discussion and review by Caroline, co-producer and her kin. A key enabling component is the Sparks Pro Cloud server. Paul will now talk through the steps. Thank you, Paul. No problem, Matt. First of all, we start off with the request for architecture. Um, it's in fact, uh, it's often called the request for architecture in um, TOGAF, but we'll call it the project brief for those who are less familiar with TOGAF terms. Um, and this project brief is then registered in the reusable asset service. Then the project brief is brought into the Architrace EA model. And this allows co-production to take place. So everybody who's involved, the stakeholders can work on it. Then more modeling can be done by Maud Modeler in response to discussions that have come out of the co-production sessions. And in step six, we round trip the refined candidate architecture. Lastly, the uh, step seven is harvesting the candidate architecture into the main repository and to carry out gap analysis against the prior state. And as you will see, steps four and five are iterative, so they can be repeated as many times as necessary. Uh, we're almost ready for a live demonstration, but we will first show what will be shown with a set of slides. So we have this high level, high street pharmacy chain, which wants to engage a consulting firm to define its transformation journey to allow a COVID era consultations. You can see the use cases that we use in this demo. So on the bottom left, we have the current state. Well, on its right is where we want to get to, i.e. our target architecture. We want to use architectural building blocks held in a library in the TOGAF structured repository. So yeah, here are the Corona Farms as is retail use cases with the areas for change highlighted. And that's all. It's far from being the candidate architecture they finally want, as they're asking their consultancy supplier to propose a new model for triaging the retail customer in this high risk and lockdown scenario. And they want their supplier to engage users on their behalf in a co-production workspace 
to gain insights into new consumer behavior where there is no precedent for these strange times. Basically, they want to reach out to their user base to get things right, and they want to do it without delay, so everything is kept as simple as possible, and no simpler. In the new model, the new candidate requirements are to make the face-to-face -face interactions between the pharmacist and retail customers safer, and possibly remotely. There are also some changes needed in the information collected for COVID risk profiling. We'll see these again. That's the project brief. Zooming into the model, as Paul said, we're showing you some slides first before we do the demo. We felt that that was just a, a nice way to ease into it because we're covering a story here. So the step in the story is, again, looking into the um, architecture repository, looking at a candidate um, uh, architecture state. And if you, one of the key things we talked about was architecture building blocks. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, okay, it basically means we have a library of templates from which we build model elements. Now, triage customer, this use case, is an instance of triage customer in the library. So what that means is the library does not have any relationships with other members of the library, but the models you build from instances made out of the architecture building blocks becomes your model. And that way you have an ability to make multiple instances of temporal instances of, of architecture states. So you could have your as is, your 2B and the transition states in between, or you could have a range of architecture state options to choose between and the thing which pins them together is the architecture building blocks okay now in the next step um we we, we started with in the first step with the, the project brief um so then we talked about registering in the reusable asset service. We're going to say RAS from now on, um, or interchangeably. What's that look like? Well, essentially, um, it's a cloud-based repository where you can put reusable assets, i.e. they can be used across different models. A RAS can be a library of model elements, uh, design patterns, reference data, it could be a library of code, or of items in a learning center, or a mixture of these. To set one of these up, create a standard EA database and make it available through ProCloud Server. Sounds easy, isn't it? And it can be. <laughs> RAS is another EA model database. It can be virtually any RDMS that doesn't that EA supports. And it doesn't have to be the same RDMS type as your EA models. That is, if you so desire, you can use a mixture of MS SQL on-prem, Oracle in the usable asset service, and MySQL in the cloud repository. It doesn't matter. With a RAS available, you can create a storage in it, connect to the reusable asset service, publish, and um, create new storage. Uh, create new storages. It, let's have a look at what it looks like. It's pretty dull. It's just a, a, an artifact there sitting in a package, but there are no clues what is contained in the artifact. Its contents are password protected and not viewable in the EA client. And the model is also security enabled and protected through um, your, your cloud security. So to the steps to register in RAS, we'll go through this in the demo. But essentially you connect to the cloud connection, register the packet, uh, the package that contains the project brief, including the ABBs, and um, publish it will as you go through that process give you a number of options and we'll we will demonstrate those as we go this is where it's showing you the dependencies between the architecture state the in lockdown state um, that a retail pharmacy want to, to have co-produced and the architectural building blocks that uh, it relies upon when you publish it essentially um, you can see the contents and you can uh, basically get feedback from the reusable asset service that what you've put in into there from your model 
um, has actually successfully been registered in the reusable asset service. Next and third step is to import the content into the co-production workspaces EA database and simply to view it. Ta-da! You're then ready to, um, I'm using another phrase here, um, you're ready to co-produce, but I also wanted to show this marriage between that concept and a concept um, espoused really by the Open UK report, an open digital approach for the NHS by Stuart McIntosh. Look him up, it's a really interesting read. It essentially talks about if you want an open architecture, then you have to architecture openly. It's, it's a key resounding message. So by putting more eyes on the, um, on the problem you're trying to solve, you can create a more open architecture. Paul. Thanks, Matt. Um, other summit presenters will give a more detailed expose on Prolaborate's functionality. So we will just show you what will come out of an iteration in the cloud in our demonstration. Uh, the objective is to get feedback on the initial candidate architecture and to help turn this into a true candidate for the future architecture. Thank you, Paul. So here we have the proposed online consultation. You can see the development on the right where the customer can now be initially triaged by the automated pharmacy assistant or APA. If the APA cannot deal with the circumstances, then the customer can be handed over to a pharmacy assistant. So we've done um, some initial open architecting, um, co-producing, step four. Step five, we've taken the feedback and we have um, modified the model. You're now pushing it out for a formal review. So it's evaluate the COVID era retail pharmacy um, requirements. And this is the screen that you'll see when you go through that process and you can either accept or uh, reject and you can put discussion reasons why uh, you can view this as a moderator or an approver and you get a number of steps along the way and we're, we're not actually going to be focusing on that in our demo um, you, we hope um, other sessions are going to pick up this in more detail uh, it is an essential part of this whole piece and there's plenty of brilliant resources available um, on the Prolaborate website to help you with it. Um, what we've seen in, in an early deployment um, where we work is people find it very intuitive and easy to pick up. So all of these different personas can actually play nicely together using this tool set. So we've done our fluid modeling and we're ready now to bring this back into the uh, architecture repository at the client site. Um, so that involves publishing to the reusable asset service. So you'll want to examine differences to ensure there aren't any nasty surprises. Um, I had one earlier today and I've got a little screenshot there. Um, and then once you're happy, you update the existing storage in the reusable asset service. It's a similar um, set of screens as when you're registering upstream. Um, to the co-production workspace, it, you you select the um, the package that um, that you want to to register. It looks at dependencies, and you go for it. So we're on to the final stage. We're going to harvest that work, and we're going to use that by bringing um, bringing the candidate architecture from the RAS storage into the architecture repository and firing up the cap analysis. So I'm gonna show you a gap analysis tool in, uh, that works in real time as well. So you've been waiting all this time. Let's crack on with the actual uh, modeling work. Now, here we have um, the 
Corona Farm on-site architecture repository. It's a slim town demo version, of course. And we um, open this diagram here, the retail pharmacy transformation. This is depicting um, the architecture state normality, face-to-face -face retail pharmacy, as we've been accustomed to. And um, the state we want to get to. So we're, well, do we? <laughs> well, we're forced to, aren't we? Um, where retail pharmacy with special message to reduce the risk of spreading coronavirus. Um, if we have a little look at the as is state, um, that was a well established way of working. And then if we look at the to be state, as far as the client is concerned at this point, they want to represent where they think their pressure points are on triaging the customer on providing details of condition and risk factors and on holding in store consultations and that's that's their brief to the consultancy firm so what they've done is they've expressed some very high level business requirements about what needs to change and that is our existing um our initial candidate architecture now, I talked about um, gap analysis. Now you see at the moment, these two things, they're just alongside each other. So let's have a little look at this um, gaps dashboard and see what that is. So um, it's, some, it's somewhere where you're able to see gaps between elements and gaps between connectors in your model. And have a little look. Well, it's empty. And have a little look at the connectors. And again, it's empty. The health dashboard, better look at that then. Why is it empty? Oh, everything seems to be okay. Um, yeah, we've got a unique library. So we only got one library to, to make our building block from. All the SBBs are not made from other uh, solution building blocks, not made from, and so on. There's a number of checks and a number of ways of navigating around, should there be a problem. So what is it? Why haven't we got a view of our gaps? Well, it's quite simple. Um, we haven't yet hooked them up. <laughs> And I'm doing that for dramatic effect. So I'm going to open the architect architecture state modeling uh, profile toolbar. And I'm going to basically say that the prior state of in lockdown was normality. Well, it was, wasn't it? So let's now go back to the gap dashboard and have a look at our, well, let's, let's check for health. See if we haven't broken anything. Nope, everything still seems healthy. We can explain those things in more detail in, in um, you know, if there are any questions around it. But let's look at the, um, the gap. Out of, oh, right. Now it's providing a little dashboard at the top to say um, of our model, about 20% of it has been added. There's new stuff. And about 80% of it, there's no gaps. And what is this? Let's have a look. So if, it's a model view in Enterprise Architect. So we have a little look at, um, at what's been added. So essentially, um, what has been added between the normality architecture state and the uh, in lockdown architecture state are these three items. And let's navigate to them. Or do we? No, what we do is we navigate to the building block in the building block library. And then we use the traceability view to see um, the fact that this building block has been used to create an element called eliminate risk of infection from face-to-face -face interactions. So we can switch to that and we can see that it exists in our lockdown state. So again, it's the building blocks which bring together and allow comparison between architecture states. I won't say anymore because they'll be giving away trade secrets. Um, and here it is, it gives um, a view as well of the things that don't have any gaps. It's a fairly trivial model at this point in time. So let's see what happens when we do the full journey. Uh, yeah, last point I want to make actually is that um, we're probably all, you know, EA users amongst us will be familiar with the baseline compare uh, feature. In fact, let's have a quick look at that, shall we? So if we do um, package control, whoa, hang on, don't slip up there. Um, if we do package control and look at package baselines, we seem to have them and you can show differences. So this will do a comparison. Now that's great. And this is not a replacement for baseline comparison. It is 
going to sit alongside it quite nicely. The difference between baseline comparison um, and the gap analysis is that baseline takes a single package and looks at that single package that can only exist in one state in your model at a time and look across you know, its history. With the gap analysis that we're showing here, what you're able to do is look between packages that represent different points in your progression of your architecture estate. So that gives you um, a, a roadmap view, uh, a transition planning view, and all those sort of views that are going to help you um, plan and undertake the journey from one architecture state to another. Now, it's worth mentioning as well at this point that there is um, the um, gap analysis matrix within uh, Enterprise Architect. And of course, this, this definitely also have utility. I did set up a profile that was going to hook off these uh, packages, but um, I'll just uh, set it up now. Whoops, that's gone off screen. I want to hide hide that from me. You won't see what I'm doing. So um, I'm going to select the target architecture, not be in lockdown, and I'm going to select the uh, normality where we where we've been shunted from. And what does it do? Well, it spreads out all of the different things that exist in the uh, in each state, and it gives you the opportunity to register gaps. So it does it in a way where you have to work your way through the model and create gap elements. Now, I'm not saying that's um, something we don't want. I, we do want that. But what we can do with the real-time view of the gaps is inform where those gap elements need to, to sit. Because creating a gap element is a good thing. It, has, it's, it can be a work item. It can be something that says, right, we have a work package to take us from this part to this part, we've got a new one, um, a, a new solution building block in our target architecture state that needs this work. Similarly, we might have um, eliminated um, or forgotten to add um, a building block from our baseline in our target. So again, you'd want to be able to record the gap element and, and uh, plan work around it. So. These are compatible tools, um, but they do play a different role. Now, next step in our process. So we've we've had a look at the uh, a project brief, the, the candidate architecture. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, push this up into the reusable asset service. So it looks as though I'm already connected. Let's disconnect um, and take it from the beginning. So publish. Reusable assets. You connect to a registry. Oh, it doesn't contain any storage. Well, that's okay because we can create some. Where's that dialog box? Hmm. We can create some if we can see where the dialog box is. Please excuse me a second. Uh, it's an admin password, that's fine. Let's have that off screen. Yes, I'll be doing quite a few passwordy type things at this point in time, so um, and you won't see them. Um, but that's probably a good thing for us all, really, isn't it? So, what I'm going to do um, is call this the Architrace Project Brief. This is the client briefing Architrace on what they want. They need to provide some passwords for read write access, and you have to confirm it. Quite right, I want it to be correct. Do this as quickly as I can. And likewise, um, a read only password is required for those you want to give read only access to. So you get levels of control as well. So we're going to create a storage architrace project brief and it's going to be accessed only with that password. Very good. It's empty. All right, so what do we do? 
we take a package. Oh, hang on, I need to put the admin password in just to uh, just to carry on with the process. So it's on my other screen, which is making this a little bit awkward, but. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, we will get there. So um, I now select the lockdown package and I'm going to register that. That's what I promised we, I'd show you, so let's do it. Um, okay, another password. There you go. And the dialog is again off screen. So it's telling me it's pending upload. Um, it's got this option to check dependencies. Let's do the complete thing. Um, I can put in versions, comments, and notes. Of course, you would for the sake of time. Um, how are we doing, by the way? Right, got to move on. Um, let's get on with registering this. It's brought up this dialog box, which then tells me, oh, look, there are some dependencies here. There's the building block library, and there's this thing called the new normal. Don't want the new normal. Um, don't want the new, don't want normality. I'm just providing a brief, and, and, and I, don't, I don't really want to provide those things. So I'm just going to put the library up there as well as the, uh, um, as well as the target architecture that we're putting. Sorry, the the candidate architecture to be made. So that takes a little while. While it does, I can um, slip to uh, the Raz Ooh, package registry. Oh, it's done. It's done. Um, we can see the contents in there just to confirm it's gone up. And then I'm going to switch to another EA window. This is the um, Architrace Raz storage. Going to make it up. So, what's in there? Let's have a little look. Um, I'll just. Let's, pack, let's reload the project because it's having a wait timeout and see what's in there. So, yeah, there's that storage that's been added. It's got ABBs, it's got lockdown. You can't really see much about them, to be honest. So, other properties, you can you can have a look, but um, it's 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 all hidden away in there. Right. Um, and again, it's um, password protected and um, yeah. Um, so, what was the next step? We're not going to linger in this one for very long. So the next step is to import to the co-production workspace. So we need to go into um, a model suitable for that. Now, because we're short of time, what I'm doing here is I'm going to load up um, yeah, into this model and then switch to another one that where the co-production work would have been done. So let's uh, let's do that now. So what we're doing, um, we've got an empty repository here that we want to publish this um, candidate architecture for review and co-production. So again, we log in and provide the passwords, slick and we import now. I'm going to select the lockdown one and package independence. It warns me about overwriting stuff that's in there, but it's empty, so that's all good. And it's a short wait while we're doing it. We shall prepare by logging in to collaborate. And we can take a look as well. So the import is still progressing. Okay, and here you can see, I mean, Okay, so why is this any different to a model transfer? Well, there's a, there's a governance wrap around it. You can essentially, it provides you um, with the security, it provides you with a way of bridging between um, the models. And um, yeah, here it is. So this is the request for architecture work. We then will go to um, a model I uploaded it to. 
I've been a bit light on dashboards here. And we can see the project brief. And we can see, all right, someone's already been in here and ended the discussion. So the, the consultant saying, thank you for this brief. I'd like please to clarify that you would like us to identify any cuts opportunities that would accelerate your path to good. So, you know, it's showing you in principle that you start the process. What I'm going to do now is um, move to um, where the end of the process would be. So this is where the consultants have done their work. They've, they've engaged with um, the, the, uh, the user base. They've engaged with um, the client organization. They've had the discussions. They've done their research and they've come up with um, some changes, some proposed changes. And yeah, they are. Um, it's, it's saying, yeah, we are going to satisfy these business requirements. But um, you know, also in, in the process of doing so, we're going to positively identify the patient. We're going to register new patients. We're going to obtain consent to access prior. Oh, some pretty heavyweight stuff in here. Um, so what are their ambitions here? So we can go in and have a look and um, go through essentially what we're looking at is a changed architecture and we it will have gone through a, a review process so um, I, I'm not going to linger very long on that because as I say I think this is going to be covered adequately by other presenters what I want to now show you is the round tripping back into enterprise architect so um, here we go so to mock that up what we've got is another model, which is the end result, which is the one I switched the Prolaborate repository to look at. And I'm going to do the backward push through the reusable asset service. So I need to connect again and provide the password. And select the so I'm going to create a new storage for this. Um, I'm going to create one that I'm going to call it round trip. OK. Now, ideally, it would be the same one. I ran into some problems earlier. This is a demo. I don't want to have those problems um, when we can work around them at the moment. And uh, we can look at uh, what the cause of those problems were with Sparks um, in the intervening period. So just getting the passwords in. And so creating a set of passwords that are required by anyone who needs to access the um, storage. Yeah, that's what we want to do. Thank you, it's done it. And now what we're going to do, oh, hang on another another password <laughs> um, so that i can work with it right we're good so what we're doing is we're saying here's the architecture state in lockdown it's the one that's been reworked um i'll just prove that to you so we see um it's been made made all fancy typical consultant work and um yeah it's try to address the, the brief. So what we're going to do is we're going to select the package. We're going to go to the reusable asset service and we're going to register it with the round trip. And bring that on screen. And we're just going to go for it. Now there's a little um, issue there with MySQL, but uh, again, that's one of those things that hasn't stopped us. It is a known problem. Um, it doesn't seem to affect um, the end result. So, oh, uh, I mean, two screens, it tends to, though. Um, so, it's looking at dependencies saying, do you want them? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. Thank you. Great. Um, actually, no, I don't. No, I don't. Second thoughts, I don't, because we've already got them over the other side, haven't we? And they'll magically stitch together. Okay. Package registration complete. We can close this model. Go back to the Corona Farm Enterprise Architect. Um, and here we have 
um, the potential to rubbish what we've put in already. Nah, it's all right, I'm feeling brave. So we need to refresh, and we have, and it wants a password. Okay, it's got the password. Um, and okay, I can see what's up in the repository. Oh, that's the architecture project brief. I don't wanna bring that in, it's what we pushed out. Now let's bring in round trip. The thing that's been worked on for us. Um, and if we um, import that, in fact, the contents of that, oh, hang on, <laughs> password, because it is a separate storage and also has password control. So now you can see um, the diagrams there are um, larger in number, the content is larger in number. So by importing that, just the package. And waiting a little while, not too long though. We should end up with um, the having round trip the work that was done by uh, Caroline, co-producer, Maud modeler, and um, all all manner of friends who joined the party. And we can go and see exactly what it was uh, that um, that they've that they've achieved. Ah, we can so long as. We hook up these states. So normality was the prior state of in lockdown. Go to our gap dashboard, check for model health. I flashed up a bit quickly. Oops, try again. Oh, just. Okay, so yeah, oh, it's telling me there's some issues to check. So um, what do I do about these? So ABBs with relationships. So I'll go to, um, so basically what it's telling me is that there are um, now in the library, some um, model elements have been connected. So we would go into this diagram and we'd um, look at what it's telling us and sure enough, find the culprit and sort it out. So that's the kind of thing that the model health will do. The uh, do -do 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 gap elements, that's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Right, so um, quite a lot has been added to this model. And there's a lot that, where there's no gap. Now, because um, I'm feeling destructive, I'm going to take away one of the use cases from 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 what the the, the uh, consultant as consultancy firm has come up with. I'm going to say, now nah, we're going to make this a free service. It's Wales, you know, we're we're, we're very magnanimous and we want to keep uh, keep the health of the nation. So we're going to get rid of pay for service, and then we'll update this view. Lo and behold, it says, oh, right, so actually something that existed before now no longer exists. Ah, let's have a look at this view as well. It's missing. Okay, so where is it? Find it in the project browser. It's pay for services in the building blocks. I go to the traceability window and I see that uh, it's a classifier for pay for service somewhere which to the related element in normality. Um, and also I have to switch back to that one. It's, um, let's have a look, Try to go through that process again. Um, pay for service, wasn't it? Oh, I've got a, um, a, uh, a dialogue window open again on the other screen. <laughs> uh, da -da 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 -da. Right, pay for service. Um, Okay, there was this other, this other one here. Or is that switch to related element? Well, that's somewhere else off um, in, the, uh, in the in the demo. So it's not actually part of an architecture state. Um, so that one um, we can ignore. So what we've shown is that by 
making dynamic changes between architecture states, you get a dynamic view of those changes. You can see what's been added, you can see what's been deleted, you can see whether there are no gaps. You can also see where names have changed, um, and then it can be extended further to look at property changes. Now, um, I think we had better drop this and go back to our presentation. Um, I hope the demo was uh, informative and wasn't too rushed, um, and that the screen was helpful. Um, the screen refresh was was sufficient. Um, yeah. So we've um, aimed to show you a way to thrive for this period of interruption and beyond um, by engaging across your supply chain using the very best tooling. By balancing the needs of fluid modeling with the need to maintain a well-governed architecture repository, and um, you know, hopefully this will address latent cultural reservations over using cloud for architecture blueprint when work. Um, by bringing the benefits, but mitigating the risk at the same time, and wait for the culture to catch up and for assurance around cloud um, to finally land and, and people to be more comfortable with it. So that was what our aim was. We'd love to hear what how, how we did against that aim. Um, is there anything that you'd like to ask? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Paul, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, there has been a number of questions uh, raised, and we've been adding them to the Teams channel as and when they came. Uh, yes. Some of the questions needs more elaborate discussion. Um, like, for example, Ian asks, who created the instances originally? Do I pull instances from RAS or the classifier? So there are a few questions that may need a bit more technical elaboration. Would you like yes. to take them now or would you like to take it in the teams and provide a detailed response? I think um, let's bring up Enterprise Architect on, and very quickly show um, yeah, very quickly show that um, if I can get the mouse on screen. So we're going to start some co-production with uh, Acme X now. Um, we've got a building block library here. All we need to do is create a diagram um, in a view. Uh, we'll call it package one for expediency. And we'll add any old diagram, really. First one that comes up. It's a use case diagram. and um, because it's a use case diagram, I'll take uh, a use case from the library, dispense treatments, I'll press control as I drag it on, and it wants to um, essentially uh, gives me the option. Do I put a link to the building block or do I create an instance of it? Well, I'm gonna create an instance of it because that's what this hangs off, dispense instance. So I'll just make it clear by, by its name that it's an instance. We now see it as an instance, and it's showing the classifier that it is. Um, so there's its instance name, dispense treatments. Uh, let's make it bigger. Dispense treatments instance, which is um, based on the dispense treatments class. And uh, yeah, there you go. Um, traceability window shows you um, that linkage. So you can switch to the related element, uh, which means Take you, take you to where it is in the browser, or you can switch to its classifier, take you to where it is in the building block library. So yeah, you you do not do not hook up the items in the building block, block library to each other as a general rule. There are exceptions to that. You might want to put design patterns in, but you um, you keep them you keep them as atomic building blocks, Lego bricks that you can then say, oh, I need a few of those. I'm going to make some. To build this architecture, I'm going to make, going to use some of the same ones and some of the different ones to make another architecture. And now I've got a way of comparing. Hopefully that answers the question for him. But I'm happy to pick it up in more detail as well on the uh, on the channel. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Matt. So there's another question for Philip, which says, Are you using instances of architecture building blocks to model multiple versions of artifacts? And if so, how successful have you found that approach? Oh, that, that's exactly what we're doing. Yes, indeed. Um, and the 
the, the way to make it successful is essentially to say, with, with this profile, we've got an architecture state, anything that sits underneath that architecture state belongs to that architecture state. Anything that sits under one that's next to it belongs to another architecture state. And then we draw a line between them to say which one precedes the other. And you can have a whole chain of them. Uh, and it can grow um, longitudinally as well as you know uh, in, in time. So, so in other words, you can you can have as many um, model elements as you would want to have in your architecture model um, for each um, for each architecture state. Brilliant. Thank you. So we still have a few more questions, which is uh, available in the teams. Uh, we. Thank you on behalf of all the attendees for the wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, you and Paul, I think we have we can see the kind of efforts you have put in for this session. Thanks once again for everyone who attended this session as well. So please do join our team's channel, the link for which has been shared in the chat window. And we'll, we'll, have, uh, we'll request Matt and Paul to be available in the teams to answer your questions. And we also have other EA practitioners who are uh, ready to discuss and share information with you so thanks once again matt and paul for the wonderful it's been a presentation pleasure. yes thank you it's been great thank you very much and thank you paul